Hi, this is Utkarsh Jain and we are on to CFA level 1 economics. Now, we are going to do microeconomics and we would be looking at the reading 16, the firm and market structure. Now, before we actually start with reading 16, it is very very important that you are completely comfortable with the concepts which were dealt in 13, 14 and 15 because reading 16 draws very heavily from the concepts from 13, 14 and 15. So especially if you are not really comfortable with these concepts, one advice is go back, have a look at these concepts, get comfortable and then probably you should start your studies of reading 16. Now. Reading 16 is all about market and market structure. So it is very imperative that we understand the definition of market. So what is a market? A market is a group of buyers and sellers. Next point that these very importantly are aware of each other. They are able to agree on a price. And lastly, the most important point is that there is an exchange of goods and services. That means ultimately there is a transaction. So this is how the market has been defined. Now there are four major types of market structures that we would be studying in this particular reading. The first type of market structure is perfect competition, which simply means that there is a huge amount of competition that exists between the various players into the market. Now, if, if we reduce the level of competition a bit and change certain characteristics of the market, we get next type of market which would be called as the monopolistic competition. Okay. We reduce the level of competition further and we would get a market which would be called as oligopoly where probably we would have 3, 5 or 6 sellers in the market and then finally we reduce the level of competition to a level not where we have only one seller in the market and now that would be called as a monopoly market. So these are the four major, these are the four major market structure and the color theme would be kept constant throughout this presentation, which means that we would be using per yellow for perfect competition, green for monopolistic, blue for oligopoly and red for monopoly. So now let us start. Now the next question that comes is that based on what factors we would decide that a particular market happens to be a perfect competition or a particular market happens to be a monopoly. These are five main factors which would distinguish markets into various categories. So what are they? Number one, which is very obvious that how many number of sellers do we have in the market? So what we know is that monopoly is going to have only one seller. As against this, a perfect competition is going to have huge amount of seller. So number of sellers is going to be one of the distinguishing factor. Next would be degree of product differentiation are these products are extremely similar to each other which means are these homogeneous products or are these products are completely different from each other point number three that how much power do the sellers have in determining the price of a particular product in the market to enter and exit the market and finally that what is the degree of non-price competition which is again some sort of repetition of product differentiation but we would also see that what is the impact of advertisement that exists in this particular segment. So now let us start we would start with perfect competition first. So now this is the metric yellow was for perfect competition, green was for monopolistic competition then oligopoly and finally red was for monopoly but as of now we would fill in the boxes for the perfect competition. So now how many sellers we are going to have in perfect competitive market? So we are going to have large number of sellers, that means many sellers. Product differentiation, are the products which are being sold are exactly similar or are they different? The products are exa exactly similar and therefore we say that the products are homogeneous. Barriers to entry, very low. Pricing power of the firm, none. A firm cannot really decide how to price the product and finally non-price competition so can a firm compete on a factor which is other than price that means can it compete based on let's say some sort of a quality or its advertisement so non-price competition does not exist in perfect competition now the way i think of perfect competition is that i think of a agricultural commodity market now let's think of a market where 
most of the farmers of the area would go and sell the agriculture produce so let's let's say that agriculture produce in our example is wheat now how many number of sellers we have we have large number of sellers not a differentiation now can we differentiate wheat based on certain parameters now assuming uh, keeping the quality constant we would say that more or less the products are into the homogeneous category that means each and every product is similar to each other now why this is important so that a competitor would not be able to compete based on a market participant will not be able to compete based on the differentiation of the product number 3 barriers to entry very low subject to assumption that the farmland is available easily number 4 pricing power of the farm a farm cannot really decide what is the price at which you want to sell its wheat or a farmer cannot decide that for the simple reason that price of the wheat would be determined by the market forces and then the farm would be required to sell its product at the existing market price it cannot decide the price for itself and then do you expect a farmer to advertise in this context no he would not advertise because it does not really make sense because the products are all the same so non price competition is none so now let's begin perfect competition we would divide this into four major parts so this would be part number 2 1 2 3 and 4 the first part is going to be the demand analysis in perfect competition which we would again divide into four sub categories price elasticity of demand cross elasticity income elasticity and consumer surplus we have already dealt with these areas extensively in the earlier readings but we'll just have a look at them one more time supply analysis that what what are the factors that determine supply in perfect competition optimum price and output and finally the factors that affect the long run equilibrium let us start with demand analysis and particularly price elasticity of demand so what does price elasticity of demand mean it simply tells us the relationship between price charged so it tells us the relationship between price charged and quantity demanded so what is this relationship generally for most of the product as we increase the price of a particular product the quantity demanded is going to decrease that means that relationship between the price and quantity demanded is going to be negative so this is our negative relationship here but then there is convention which is used in cfa curriculum what is the convention and this convention is used by many economists convention simply says that we are though the relationship is negative and is going to be a negative number we are going to simply use this as an absolute value that means we are simply going to use positive values for it so how do we calculate price elasticity of demand we would say percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in price so now let's let's do a small example let us say that current price is 10 rupees and quantity demanded at this price is 100 now the price has been shifted from 10 rupees to 12 rupees because of which the quantity demanded now has become 70 so when we shift when we shifted our price from 10 to 12 the percentage increase in price was 20% so we would simply put this into formula 20% here the percentage decrease in quantity demanded from 100 to 70 was 30% so we would put 30% here this is negative 30% but the fact that we have a extra negative sign here so that would mitigate this negative which means that price elasticity of demand would be 1.5 so what does this tell us that every now and then if the price is increased by 1% the resultant decrease in quantity demanded is going to be 1.5% now one common mistake that candidates generally do on the exam is that they simply forget to consider this percentage sign here and they would simply calculate it based on absolute values so please make sure that we are going to use percentage change in quantity demanded and percentage change in price so now we can have three possible scenarios with price elasticity of demand either the price elasticity can be elastic it can be inelastic or it can simply be unitary elastic so number 1 that price elasticity is elastic so what does it mean for simple understanding purpose we can simply say that elastic demand means that you are the consumer is 
sensitive to the price that is being charged so what does it mean it means that if you increase the price so let us say the price has increased been increased by 10% the impact on quantity demanded is going to be more than 10% so let us say that quantity demanded decreased by more than 10% that means that number that we have is 15% divided by 10 which means that price elasticity of demand is 1.5 and therefore we would say that demand is elastic that means consumers are very very sensitive to the price that is being charged what is the meaning of inelastic demand it means that even though price was increased by 10% the resultant decrease in quantity demanded let us say was only let us say 6% which means that consumers are not so sensitive to the price that is being charged and we would say that the price elasticity is inelastic it is going to be less than 1 and finally unitary elastic where this number is 1 which means that if the price increased is by 10% then quantity demanded is going to decrease by 10% so the relationship is 1 is to 1 now what variables price elasticity depends on availability of substitutes and which is very obvious Now let us say that we are we are talking about a particular product A. Now price of this product has been increased by price has increased by ten percent. Now if there is a strong substitute which is available for this product, a lot of consumer will simply shift to B substitute product, which means that quantity demanded would decrease substantially. But if the substitutes are not available, then probably there is no choice, and consumer still need to consume this particular product. which means that if the substitutes are available then the demand is going to be very elastic but if the substitutes are not available if there are no close substitutes then demand would relatively inelastic second point is that share of consumers budget spent on a particular item so let us say that there is a particular consumer let us say a he spends almost 40% of his income on a particular product so let us say that he spends almost 40% of his income on a particular product so let's say rent or lease that he pays for his house now the price of this rentals that he is supposed to pay every month that has been increased substantially and the fact that price of rentals has been increased substantially and it constitutes a major part of his income he is going to be extremely sensitive about this increase in price that means higher the portion of budget spent on a particular item higher is going to be the elastic elasticity as it is this let's think of salt so let us say that price of salt is 10 and now the price of salt has been increased to 11 since we spend a very very small portion of our income on salt we are going to be the increase in price we are going to be relatively inelastic to the increase in price that means higher the amount of budget spent more elasticity lesser the amount of budget spent on a particular item less elasticity next point would be length of the time considered so what does it mean it means that we'll stick to the same example that rent on which 40% of the income was spent the price of this rentals were increased but then in the short term consumer cannot really change his accommodation so easily which means that in the short term demand is going to be relatively inelastic but in the long term at the first possible opportunity of shifting from that particular premises he would do that which means that in the long term demand is going to be elastic so length of the time considered again makes a significant impact on price elasticity of demand now this is something which is important from your exams perspective that when demand is elastic which means that if the price is increased by 10% quantity demanded is going to decrease more than 10% in that case an increase in price is going to result into lower total revenue that means if a firm increases price in this scenario it would result into a total revenue which is less than what revenue used to be before increase in the price but if the demand is inelastic that means if the price elasticity is less than 1 in that case increase in price in fact would result into increase in total revenue so let's think of it this way let's say that price has been increased by 10% but 
but then resultant decrease in quantity demanded might only be 2% so that total new revenue that we receive that revenue is going to be higher and finally unitary elastic it means that irrespective of whether the firm increases or decreases the price the total revenue is going to be same so there would not be it will have no impact on the total revenue now there are two extreme cases of price elasticity of demand the scenario that we have on the left hand side where we have a horizontal demand curve this kind of a scenario we would say that it is the consumers are extremely sensitive to the price that means at the current level of price consumer would order quantity but the moment prices increase the quantity demanded is going to be zero which means we say that elasticity of price is infinity and it is a perfectly inelastic demand as against this if the demand curve is vertical what it means is that no matter what is the price charged the quantity demanded is always going to be same and if this is the case we would say that elasticity of price is zero it is completely perfectly inelastic demand curve of course for a perfect competition for an individual firm the demand curve that exists is a completely horizontal demand curve i am repeating it again this is a demand curve that is going to exist for an individual firm for the entire market even in perfect competition demand curve is going to be regular downward sloping so what does it mean it means that a perfectly competitive firm is a price taker it cannot determine the price it needs to simply accept the price which has been determined by the market forces so now we are through with price elasticity let us start with income elasticity what does income elasticity mean it simply tells us the relationship between the income and the quantity demanded so what it means is that when consumers income increases generally the demand for those products is going to increase so how do we calculate that we simply say percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in income so let us say that income increased income increased by 10% because of which quantity demanded of good a increased by 20% so what we would simply say is that 20% divided by 10% the income elasticity is 2 now for a normal goods the income elasticity is always positive and it makes a not the inferior goods so when the income increases a consumer would be inclined to consume more of that that means quantity demanded is going to increase as against this for inferior goods this relationship is going to negative this relationship is going to be negative so what does it mean it means that when income increases of a particular person he would prefer to consume less of inferior quality good and he would shift to normal category of goods that means as the income increases the quantity demanded of inferior goods is going to decrease and therefore we say that relationship is negative next point is cross price elasticity which means that we are going to see the impact of change in price of good b on the quantity demanded of good a so now we want to see the change in demand for product a for a change in the price of product b so let's see how it works out this is how we are going to calculate this that percentage change in quantity demanded a divided by percentage change in price of b so let us say that we have two products here so let's define these products as let us say coke and pepsi these are the two products under consideration now what happens is that the price of pepsi has increased by 10% now simply think of it this way that coke and pepsi are some sort of substitutes of each other and when the price of pepsi is going to increase the natural tendency of the consumers would be that they are going to have consume more of coke that means quantity demanded of coke is going to increase so when the price increased by 10% quantity demanded increased by let us say 20 since this number is coming out to be positive and the fact that this number is coming out to be positive for those products which are completely complete substitutes of each other so 
what we would say is that if these products are complete substitutes of each other this number is going to be positive but let's think of it this way let's say versus a pizza is the first unit and next one is let us say coke now if price of this particular good this particular product has increased or should we say these are complements i think for many of us yes so if the price of this product has increased automatically the quantity demanded of coke the demand that was coming through the consumption with these these products is going to decrease and therefore that when price of this product increases the quantity demanded of other decreases the relationship is inverse so when goods are complement of each other though you might question whether these are really complements but if we assume that these are complements then the relationship is going to be negative that means for complements this relationship is negative for substitutes this relationship is positive okay so we are through with this we are through with this we are through with this now we have to go on to the consumer surplus now at this stage we would keep it relatively short term but later on we'll have to deal with this concept one more time so at this stage what consumer surplus simply means is that it is a difference between value and price so what does it mean let's say that you go and consume a cup of coffee or a mug of coffee which costed you 10 but then when you consumed it you thought that this coffee is worth 50 i would have i wouldn't have mind paying 50 to consume this coffee that means this is the value that you perceive from this particular unit whereas this is the price that you paid for this and the difference between these two is nothing but the consumer surplus which is 40 in this particular case so this is what consumer surplus really means so now we are through with demand now we will go on to the supply what are the factors and variables that determine the supply in case of perfect competition so now the supply curve of a individual firm in perfect competition is positively sloped so for an individual self firm we are going to have a positively sloped supply curve and exactly the same shape is going to exist even for a entire market so even the entire industry supply curve is going to be positively sloped so what does it mean it means that at a higher price the quantity supplied is going to be higher as the price is increase as the price is increase the quantity supplied is going to increase now we would do two types of analysis here first one would be short term supply curve and the next one would be long run supply curve portion of firms short run marginal cost curve above the average variable cost okay. now to completely understand this i think we need certain concepts that we did in the previous readings so let's have a quick recap of them the average variable cost curve is going to be u shaped it's going to look like this the average total cost curve is again going to be u shaped so this is average total cost curve the marginal cost curve is going to be somewhat like this it's going to be a j shaped curve so this is a marginal cost curve so the short run supply curve of a firm in perfect competition is going to be the that portion of its curve which is above the average variable cost and why average variable cost because we have seen earlier and in the short run in order to operate firm should be able to recover its variable cost so this portion of its curve is going to be the short run supply curve but in the long run it would not make sense if the firm sells below the average total cost in fact so in the long run firm's supply curve in the long run the supply curve of a firm is going to be portion of the firm's long run marginal cost curve above the average total cost so what do you need to remember for the short run it is going to be the portion of marginal cost curve which is above which is above the variable cost curve in the long run it is portion of marginal cost curve which is above the average total cost curve So now we are through with supply analysis. Let us jump on to optimum price and output. 
So now, how do you calculate optimum price and output? You simply equate the demand and supply function. And we did a lot of calculations by equating demand and supply function in the first trading on microeconomics. We would try to save time by avoiding that portion here. Now, what is important for the exam is something that we've already spoken about that for an individual firm, the demand curve is going to be completely horizontal. But for the entire industry, the entire market, the demand curve is going to be downward sloping. It is possible for a perfectly competitive market that demand schedule of the entire market is downward sloping and it makes sense that for an entire market, if the price reduces, contrary demand it is going to increase. Now for an individual firm, price is equal to average revenue is equal to marginal revenue. If you are wondering why, just go back and probably revise the earlier readings. We have dealt with these topics extensively. Now price is always going to be equal to average revenue, but for a perfectly competitive firm, it is also equal to marginal revenue. Okay, so let's try to understand the equilibrium position now. This is the current scenario. This is the price on the y axis. This is the quantity on the x axis. This is the average total cost curve, which is a u shaped curve. This is our marginal cost curve, which is going to look like a j shaped curve. Now, the point where these intersect, this is going to be the lowest point on the average total cost curve. So, the point where average total cost and marginal cost are same. That is the point which is lowest for average total cost. Now the demand curve is going to be a horizontal curve here, which means that equilibrium price would be the price where this demand curve, which is also for a perfect competition, the marginal revenue curve. So a point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So this particular quantity would be equilibrium quantity QE and this particular price would be equilibrium price SPE. That means for a perfect competition firm, marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost is equal to average total cost is also equal to price. All these factors are exactly same and that is also the reason why economic profit for a perfectly competitive firm is zero. It does not get to earn any economic profit because it is going to sell all its products at average total cost. Now, so this is a scenario, we finished perfect competition, we have taken care of all these parts. Now we would move on to the next part of competition market structure, which would be monopolistic competition, which would be covered into the part two of this particular reading.